Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 6th of March, 2019, Ash Wednesday. All right, guys, welcome to the program. It's going to be another great program. You know why? This is going to be the most unscripted, unscripted in the last 490 some episodes. We don't know what we're going to talk about. We're going to sit down and just see how the breeze flows, talk as friends, have fun, and maybe cover some topics because we all know what's happening uh, here in America and around the world. And it'll be kind of fun to see how people, uh, George, Gavin, and I let this come out, let you hear what the story is. Before we get started, please like, comment, subscribe, and share these episodes. Part of our growing audience is you guys helping us grow. We know that you're the most important part of Anglican Unscripted, and we really appreciate you tuning in for each episode. And obviously, we have a podcast, too. And if by chance you're one of those modern people who like to tweet, tweet the show, retweet the show. Let people know through Twitter that we exist. George, Gavin, how are you guys doing this week? Well, I'm of the firm opinion that we're all doomed unless something happens. <laughs> we're doomed. It's Ash Wednesday. Gavin, how are you? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with George. I, uh, I'm getting increasingly apocalyptic, and I, I wish I wasn't. I, I spent the whole of my life associating apocalypticness with mental instability, and uh, I, I don't like my growing sense of apocalypticism at all. I'm all ready because the white-robed army of martyrs uh, are all set to march. Uh, things are pretty bad in the world today, not just the United States, because actually I think they're worse in England uh, on a moral, intellectual, sociological plane. And we're following close behind and we're seeing in Australia and Canada and other places in the West. I agree with um, George on that, Gavin, because I'm looking at the news in Britain. I'm watching uh, this guy named Tommy Robinson being banned from YouTube, from Facebook, from Twitter. Mm. His book is not no longer available on Amazon.com. There is a censorship going on that I've never seen before in that little continent we call the UK. And I, reminded, I think we need to talk about that today. I'm, I'm reminded about the, the sense of tectonic plates shifting. And then if they shift with too much energy, you get an earthquake. But what we have at the moment is, is an unstoppable force and an immovable object. Uh, the unstoppable force is the LGBT agenda, which is involves the sexualization of identity, which is moving through our education system and has now reached our, our infant school children in a new government program designed to teach them everything they needed to know about uh, LGBT-ness, transvesticism, and uh, uh, changed identities. And then you have, at the same time, uh, Islam, which refuses to accept it and won't move. And one of the interesting things that happened this week is that a school in Birmingham, uh, the Muslim parents took such exception to the sexualization of their children through this new government curriculum that they removed 80% of the children from the school in an act of essentially civil disobedience. Now, one of the reasons why that matters is that over the last 30 years, uh, the left and Islam have had an alliance together whilst Christianity has been pressurized and reduced to incompetence and incoherence, mainly through uh, weakness and, uh, uh, and lack of faithfulness. But suddenly, for the first time, this left Islam allegiance has broken, and they are, um, in, in Birmingham at least, on this first occasion, confronting one another. And one has a great sense that, that these, these are, to go back, tectonic plates, which may produce earthquakes in our society. Gavin, I want to take the geology motif and move it farther. The earthquakes are already happening, but what follows the earthquakes is the eruption of a volcano. And I believe that with these plates shifting of the clash between the residual of Western culture, the vast majority of people, as I would say, the Islamic movement and the progressive movement, you're, the earthquakes are happening right now with small scale civil disobedience, which I think will get larger. I'm fearful that this is going to turn to violence, whether it's armed insurrection as mm. of uh, in Beirut or low level fighting as in Belfast or or how it or if it takes a particularly oh. English way forward. I think that the government is going to lose control of law and order. 
I would <laughs> not be surprised to see what we see in France happening in London uh, and maybe Manchester, not Birmingham, probably more than any other place where there's burning of cars in the streets. There's violent protests from different organizations. Now it's going to happen in places like Slough and Huddersfield and these, these towns where you've had the rape culture that the police yes. have overlooked. And That's I think the, eventually yeah. the white working class is going to, is not going to, we're not going to, there's going to be violence. I think there it's is, going to happen. There's, there's, there's very real anger about the mass rape of white girls and women amongst the residual white working class. It's, it's enormously angry. The question is, will it, will it take to the streets? I think the answer might well be Tommy Robinson. It may very well be that he will be the cat. Whatever happens to him will be will effectively be the catalyst, which might unleash this frustration and violence. The mainstream media and the the mainstream culture uh, has has done its very best to demonise anybody who doesn't accept the um, the progressive agenda as it's being imposed on us and as and it's being wound up very quickly. And, and precisely because of that, there is no room for dissent, and there is a danger that uh, it may spill over. The, the, the uh, history does not repeat itself. Every situation is new and unique. But the French Revolution still gives us wonderful guides of how human, how human people act. And we're seeing the, the revolution turn on itself. Uh, we have a British resident, Martina Navratilovna. The first, if you will, out gay tennis sports, sports superstar, hero. Yeah. a 40 year leader in the gay and lesbian movement is now blackballed uh, by the gay and lesbian movement because she refuses to accept allowing transgendered athletes for men to compete as women because of their own say so. Well, and Jeremy, and, and Jeremy, that, I'm sorry, go ahead. Jeremy and Greer and Peter Tatchell are both no platformed at universities. Uh, I mean, they, they used to be the cutting edge of progressive culture. But they're now deemed too Nazi, too fascist, too, to, to even appear. The, the, the freedom of speech has been curtailed uh, to an extraordinary extent. And the, yes, the question is, will there be a sufficient pressure of frustration amongst the general populace to rise up in frustration? Or have they been, have they been cowed? Have, have they been, in, in terms of uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, have they been so drugged by drugs, by music, uh, and by, by, by comfort and media, uh, that, that they no longer care enough to take to the streets? I, we I, don't I, I, well, hold on. Let me describe a little brainwashing that I saw last week. Here in Connecticut, they had the state championship cross-country races last week. It was won, the female race, by two transgendered men. These uh, got clearly guys, no operations, no hormones, no nothing. Uh, they just said, hey, today I'm a girl. Uh, today I identify as a girl. And they ran in the one. In the locker room, they're interviewing the, the two girls who would have won, and they had not competed. And they're like, it was just so nice that we could compete with transgendered men or transgender women. And it's so cool that they're allowed to compete with us. And you could tell behind their eyes they were just lying because they didn't want to be ostracized both those girls lost their scholarships and are not they're not going to get the scholarships they're going to go to these two uh transgendered men and that's the new normal gavin you can speak to this with more uh, with first-hand experience but this is how the communist world operated for some 70 years where everybody knows it's a lie everybody knows it's a lie what the, the, the state, the masters are telling us to repeat. And we repeat it. And we're afraid to, in Stalin's time, we're afraid to say anything uh, contrary to the party line because we'll be killed. But by the time of uh, perestroika in the, in the 90s, uh, the state was no longer fearful. So people could finally say, this is a lie. But what we're seeing in the UK is, if you will, Nobody's being shot yet, but we have that almost Stalinist worldview mindset that if you are a deviation from the party line, you are a deviationist who must be exiled to Tashkent with Trotsky or something. And, and I'm just waiting for the ice picks to come out. Well, I think you described it very well, George. And one of my frustrations is that um, there, there are two kinds of aberrant Christianity at the moment, which I feel aren't stepping up to the mark. One is a historic Protestantism looks over its shoulders and constantly wants to argue about theological issues that were current in the 16th century. 
uh, when, when even the Roman Catholic Church has accepted in a concordat with the Lutherans the notion of salvation by faith um, and, and absolutely refuses to look at the need for a new reformation within the church today, which has to do with being faithful to a biblical anthropology and rejecting, not indulgences, not, 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 not um, uh, raising money to spring cells out of purgatory, but rejecting instead a corrupt and sexualized anthropology that, that, that it has no connection at all with what we see in scripture. Uh, so there's, there's, there's people who look backwards and then there's the, the, the people who have simply accepted what has been offered them in the name of this lie and tried to incorporate it into Christianity. Now, there are some other Christians who say, we want to keep the faith and we intend to be disobedient and we intend civil disobedience. We intend ecclesial disobedience because we have to be faithful to Jesus and to the gospels and to the apostolic tradition. But that number is small. And I, I'm hoping there may be some catalyst which uh, allows people to re react to the lie and to um, actually make a stand that needs to be made. Winked in and winked out. You're in, you're back, don't worry. Yeah, do you so you you saying you fell asleep? Something happened. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, well, I think that's a good I... point. Gavin is you know there's such a historical concept text to this. It's in a small and big way history repeating itself. Well, so certainly there's, there are. I mean, George is quite right. History doesn't repeat itself, mm -hmm. but but there are there are if you like fluxes within history which reoccur. So one of the fluxes that we've had, and I think, again, George is right, dates back to the French Revolution. We have a form of secular equality of outcome uh, that is imposed by violence and by force. There was a great deal of violence in the French Revolution and a great deal uh, in the Soviet uh, Revolution. And it's come back again, this time not through the uh, engineering of uh, revolution by the proletariat, but instead through the culture wars. What is extraordinary is to see how many Christians are willing to surrender their Judeo-Christian culture and adopt this new politicized secularization wholesale in the, in the name of being friendly and so-called loving. Actually, we are required to stand against it. It's the gospel of nice being propagated by Justin Welby. Um, and I am, a, I have to say, I suffer from this as well. I am a pragmatist. So long as my little turf is protected and everybody's happy and numbers are up, I'm not going to worry myself with what the institution upstairs is doing. I'm guilty of not having a fully thought out ecclesiology. I'm a Congregational Episcopalian, a Congregationalist Episcopalian. I think but one of the, the one gospel of nice is people where people just don't appreciate what's going on. I, I was very impressed when I used to smuggle uh, theology books and Bibles to the underground Catholic Church in Czechoslovakia in the early 1980s. I was impressed by, by the way in which ecclesiology provided an umbilical cord of lifeline to a network of Christians throughout the country. The, great, the, pro the problem with being a prag pragmatic congregationalist is that you exist in isolation to, to other Christians. And if it's going okay for you, well, that's great. Or if you fall by the wayside, that's sad. But the great danger is you you get picked off, and I'm 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 a great I'm a convert to a to a Catholic with a capital C, including orthodoxy, to a Catholic apostolic ecclesiology, which provides a delta a deltered network flowing from an apostolic uh, episcopate, whose job it is to articulate the faith and to provide for sacraments, uh, um, for communities of sacraments and word. So the, uh, if we're going to go underground, I think it'd be better to go underground with a working ecclesiology than with a form of pragmatic congregationalism. So it's 2019. The only visible people in Britain who will not let their children be thrown into the mix of LGTB education are the Islamic people. The Christians aren't doing it. This is, is a very interesting future? moment. Well, it's a very interesting moment, Kevin, because um, it, it, uh, this is one of the tectonic issues before. Over the last years, the progressive left have made an, a pragmatic allegiance with Islam, designating Islam one of those uh, victimized culture that needs a redistribution of power. Um, and Islam has, has accepted the free pass that progressive secularism has given it. 
there was always going to come a point when Islam would stand up to progressive secularism and, and indeed take the fight to it. It's happened for the first time this week in Birmingham when the Islamic parents withdrew their children from the LGBT program and the whole school. Um, whether, they, whether they've peaked too early uh, and they will be told to quieten down and, and not reveal the long-term strategy too early, I, I, I don't know. But it's the beginning of, of a new shift in this three-way relationship between Judeo-Christianity, Islam and progressive culture. But for 30 years, they've been in bed together. Yeah. Wow. In, in American politics, we have, for the first time since the 1930s, open outright anti-Semites in Congress, people propagating uh, vile Jew hatred. Yeah. And the uh, response has been interesting of, well, we don't want to upset these, we don't want to basically upset these people because it seems to us that the woke, I hate that word, the woke edge, the progressive liberal edge of the Democratic Party is accepting of these people's anti-Semitism, so we don't want to upset that crowd. But at the same time, we're now starting to see quietly, in some most cases, leading Democratic politicians saying, look, this is a step too far. Now, whether they can rescue their party from the grips of anti-Semitism um, remains to be seen. But we're... The Democratic Party, like the Episcopal Church, is, in the, is becoming farther, pushed farther and farther and farther less by smaller and smaller, smaller groups with actually different end games, uh, but whose the effects will be the destruction of the institution. It is amazing within the historical memory of one generation of the Holocaust that anti-Semitism in Europe in particular could find itself so virulently center stage. And yet nobody tells the truth. Nobody says, this is Islam. This is in order to buy Islamic votes uh, by, by the left. The anti-Semitism has been named, that's a start, but nobody tells the truth about what the real uh, political dynamic that constituted it. We had a federal judge go before Congress to be appointed to a federal judgeship in Nebraska, and the, Congre and the senator from Hawaii asked him would he continue to be a member of the Knights of Columbus because that was a racist group akin to the Ku Klux Klan. The Knights of Columbus is, for those who don't know, who may not be Americans, the Knights of Columbus is a Catholic fraternal organization that supports hospitals and does works of mercy. We had a uh, uh, Naomi Rao, a, uh, a, wom a woman of Parsi background, Indian, her parents were immigrants from India, who converted to Judaism and and is now can and was uh, before the, the Senate to be confirmed for the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. And she was attacked basically for her religion. We now have Parsi slash Jewish women. You can't get more uh, exotic than that being attacked for being believing in traditional family moral values, in her case, traditional Orthodox Judaism. This is the United States we're talking about, not Nazi Germany, not, not fascist Italy. This is America, and it's 2019. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think about this often. And where is the church? Well, we're releasing wow. statements about mosquitoes and, uh, uh, you know, just anodyne twaddle. The House of Bishops are going to meet this weekend, and they're going to have deep and heavy discussions about whether or not to go to Lambeth, whether or not to recommend the latest, uh, greatest social thing. Do they have anything that speaks to people's internal emotional longings for salvation? Not in the slightest. I, I see that in a few moments I have to go to a, to a Eucharist for Ash Wednesday, which I'm going to be invited to repent. I think one of the things that the church should repent of is its abrogation of Christian culture and Christian values, surrendering them both to a politically, uh, to a politically muscular Islam and surrendering them to uh, a corrupt progressive agenda. We need, we need a new reformation within Christianity. And I, I would hope that the repentance we're limbering up for this Ash Wednesday might start with personal, moral, ethical, spirit, but doing this much strategically faithful. So, what are you guys going to do? I need our audience to pray for us. 
This has been a horrid week for George, Gavin, and I uh, in our, our, our daily lives. And we're coming under, you know, attack as the show grows, as we are true believers, as we sit down to deliver news to you each week. There is a force beyond reason coming against us individually. And I would really appreciate if you would keep us in your prayers. If somebody wants to volunteer to set up a, a small prayer team or something like that, uh, get in contact with me through your email. Um, it's something that we're going to have to have part of our future. Uh, Gavin is really only 27 years old. It's just <laughs> Gavin is 27. He's had a rough week. <laughs> no, but uh, Satan is a roaring lion that prowls about seeking to devour us. Well, and that, he's, he had true. a good week. Satan had a good week. And so, uh, you know, let I'm going to let you guys work out organization of this and uh, help us. Reach out to us. Uh, you know my email address is anglicantv at gmail.com. Gentlemen, I hope to see you soon. And I hope that uh, Ash Wednesday is more than the ashes for you. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashland, and you've been listening to episode 494 of Anglican Unscripted on Ash Wednesday, our invitation to turn and find a new direction. Amen. Amen.